This is a production of Cornell University. Well, thanks a lot. It's uh, good to be here. And, uh, so I'm going to talk today, again, as it turns out, on an ongoing project with broccoli that's been moving faster and slower over the years, and it's recently started moving uh, faster again. And uh, the issue is to have a broccoli industry in the eastern United States. Uh, broccoli is a vegetable that is consumed to an astounding extent. People, it has this reputation of people not liking it. But it turns out that people are eating it perhaps in secret, but people are eating a lot of it. <laughs> uh, on the eastern seaboard, on the order of 800 million pounds a year. And the broccoli that we're eating is grown almost exclusively in California, Arizona, and northern Mexico. We really don't grow any of it on the East Coast. And it's a, New York is a great place to raise cabbage. Whole crops grow like the Dickens here. Uh, but broccoli is not part of the, part of the picture. Uh, so I'm going to talk today, first of all, to tell a little bit about what's the problem. Uh, a little bit of some of the genetics that we've done over the years uh, to try to figure out what's controlling the development in broccoli and some of the gene regulation, uh, which I'm going to be fairly quick on. Denise McClough did this work and reported on it as a group just a few years ago. And then talk about uh, what it's going to take to develop a broccoli industry here in the next few years. So the problem is that you get ugly broccoli. Uh, so if you're sitting in the back row, you may be saying, huh, that looks OK to me. Wait a few pictures, you'll see. Uh, but the growing conditions that we have on the East Coast result all too often in broccoli that has yielded fine, but nobody wants to buy it. And so it costs you an awful lot of money. Uh, it's expensive enough to grow that even a small field an investment of thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars. It's all down the drain if it looks like this. So it, we know cauliflower, we know broccoli. We think those are two, perhaps even different species. It turns out they're nothing of the sort. It's that you have a rest of development at different stages, and it keeps growing bigger and bigger, but staying at the same stage of development. It's a little bit unusual. In fact, these are the extreme cases of this particular phenomenon. Uh, and so you can have where you get a reproductive meristem formed, and it just makes more reproductive meristems. And that's our familiar cauliflower. They can do that for a while, and then start to make the first bit of a floral primordium, which is happening in that one there. They're little, starting to become a little sphere. Um, the stem can elongate a little bit. This is actually a commercial variety, uh, which for no good reason is called purple cauliflower. It's not cauliflower, and it's not consistently purple either, but that's what it got called. Uh, so that's a form that exists commercially that's intermediate. Then we have broccoli that can make buds that are too small in here when it's heat stressed, but there's other buds that are developing well. Regular broccoli, and then uh, this happens to be gaiman, but there are many uh, brassicas that will make really big flower buds. Uh, they come much closer to opening. So these are all stages of arrest. They spend some time at that and sort of uniformly all the meristems uh, or uh, organs develop to the same state. So that is uh, a continuum that exists genetically. We just happen to like a couple of different spots on that continuum. And so when we end up being a little bit here and there, it's no good. So it, what you can see is that there are these whorls that the flowers develop in, the inflorescences are all packed together tight. And normally broccoli buds look like these guys here. And those are ones that in this case got past a critical sensitive stage of development before they experienced a temperature that was too high. And these little guys uh, were delayed because they were not getting the appropriate signal to keep going. And 
And so they've ended up a few days apart in uh, their development. And one of the other things that happens because these little guys are growing slower, the plant is growing fast, it's going to grow somewhere, you get actually uh, a little bit of uh, release of vegetative meristems, leaf primordial bracts overdevelop. So you get something that's called leafy heads, a description of it. But if you look at the common heading brassica crops, so we've got cauliflower in four different types, and broccoli in a couple of different types, and have them at these different temperatures, you get different kinds of development. So here we have the regular broccoli. If it's cold, you get the beautiful broccoli. As it warms up, you start getting these little uh, floral primordia, <coughs> delayed development, and if it gets too hot, they just remain there. On the other hand, with cauliflower, if you have winter cauliflower that's cold, you get nice cauliflower, it's just the reproductive meristem. Late cauliflower is at somewhat higher temperatures, early cauliflowers. Tropical cauliflowers, actually at our summer temperatures, will produce cauliflower. Uh, all of these, if they get too hot, they just remain vegetative. The signal to go reproductive isn't there. It's not getting chilling hours, if that's a familiar concept to you. And a lot of these cauliflowers, if it gets too cold, they'll develop the little floral primordia. They're often white. It's called ricey. Uh, if it gets too warm, there's a, the really late ones will start to develop bracts. And they look fuzzy. That's the technical term for it. They're fuzzy. Uh, it's not a uh, so the sensitive stage during development, this is the vegetative meristem. It's triggered to go reproductive. So all of the work on you know, vernalization and induction of flowering and all that sort of stuff, that happens in between those two. The part we're going to talk about is what happens next. And if you're working with uh, a spring ephemeral, like Raptopsis, for instance, uh, many other uh, plants go through these phases very, very quickly. Uh, once they're committed to flowering, they flower. There are complex ones. Um, actually, the one that's most similar to this is lilac. It's not closely related at all, but very similar in its uh, inflorescence development. So you have, in the axle here, it's, there's a little flat spot there. That's the sign that it's gone reproductive. Then you start getting Meristems made on, as they go out, they, they ramify, they get more and more of these guys. Um, so this is almost a millimeter across. You're starting to see some of the bracts there. And here, there's a few floral primordia starting to form. Um, the, you can see sepals right on the edge when they make floral primordia. So if it continues, like that, it'll make cauliflower. And if when it's really small, it's triggered to make floral primordia, this will become broccoli. So that's the difference between cauliflower and broccoli right there when that step happens. Uh, so we have the uh, pathways that drive flowering. So like I said, the vegetative to reproductive transition, there's a gene called leafy that is often responsible for this. When it gets turned on, it goes reproductive. And there's a bunch of pathways. Uh, so autonomous means that when it's old enough, it gives up and says, look, I'm going to flower here one day. Uh, Photocarriot, so that it happens at the right time of year. Vernalization, so it happens at the time, right time of year. Uh, there's a gibberellin pathway. All of them feed in to the same gene to turn it on. Uh, this gene turns on a gene called a petala, or one of a number of genes in uh, that family uh, that triggers uh, flower formation as an organ. Uh, and so that's the late step that I showed you. And so that seems to take chilling hours. So where the induction of flowering usually takes chilling in the, in the range of 5 degrees, 10 degrees. 
In the broccolis, it seems to be that the chilling required here, the threshold temperature below which chilling hours are counted, is somewhere in the 20s Celsius. So fairly warm. And incidentally, where our summer night temperatures tend to be. So the problem is that it's not accumulating chilling hours in the summer nights when it normally would be uh, getting enough cool conditions to go on to make a uniform head. Uh, well, just to show you what uh, this is some work I did a while ago, but I think the pictures are fun. So this is in the vegetative stage. So the background is purple. Silver, white silver grains are where the gene is expressed. So at the leafy, uh, at the vegetative stage, there's very little of it. But then when you start getting the reproductive meristems forming, there's a lot of expression at the tip of those. So there's, so this is a reproductive meristem. It's making warm meristems <coughs> around there. That's where the intense uh, expression is. And then you start getting flowers, and it turns off. So there's less, little expression there, but down here where it's making both, uh, more meristems, the early floral primordial. Whereas AP1, this is the early floral meristem, here's the atrial dome, uh, that's going to be a sepal, sepal, so lots of expression in there, and uh, the developing flower, you see expression right around the, right around the top there. Uh, so those seem like the key genes, right, that, that's, that turning them on at the right time is what's going to make the uh, flowers develop properly. Uh, and since that's the difference between broccoli and cauliflower, there's been some study of that. Uh, and so a number of people working, uh, a number of people uh, working on both the Arabidopsis and Brassicola racia have identified the AP1 and cal cauliflower is very similar to AP1, it just happens to only occur in Brassicola racia. Uh, the mutations in these are the cause of the difference. Uh, and so it could be that the more sensitive ones just have fewer copies, and so it takes more signal to get them going, to kick them over the threshold or something. Uh, so that looked good in some crosses between cauliflower and uh, broccoli. They made a segregating mapping population, uh, and it behaved very nicely, just, just as you would predict. Um, so we took that model, and we looked at what uh, the uh, collection in the germplasm repository was. So this is work with uh, Joanne LeBate and Larry Robertson and Angela Baldo at the germplasm repository. Uh, so we tested a number of different models to see uh, whether they would predict the phenotype that we actually saw. And so one is that this uh, cauliflower gene is responsible for the difference. That was the original proposal. Um, and the second one, that, that it's the uh, uh, apetalo gene, or that they're dominant by locus. If the locus, it's an additive but each locus turns either on or off, or it's just added to the alleles, how many dominant alleles do you have? And uh, so the, one that, the ones that come out significant, the one that's particularly significant is that dominant by locus looks like it contributes to it, so that's good. But then you look at how much of the variation in phenotype is explained by it, 7%. So even though we got the statistics to show something, 7% isn't much. So the genes probably do what they're supposed to do, but they're not really explaining the variation that we're seeing in that population. So there's uh, clearly a lot more going on. Uh, so we wanted to dig into that. So this is uh, where Denise did a lot of her work. Uh, we used a genotype called Green Harmony. This is a commercial cauliflower that's grown in Taiwan, which is warm. Uh, so they get 32 day, 25 night, they make a nice green head of cauliflower in the field. This was uh, growth chamber grown. But what was nice about this is we could either have it remain as the reproductive meristems, we could make floral primordia at intermediate temperatures, or make a regular broccoli. Um, 
when we've grown this in the field, the ones that finish up in August look like this, and the ones that finish up in October look like that. It's, it's the same planting. As it goes on, uh, changes it, its appearance. So by using these, we could look at uh, the expression of these and some related genes to see whether they could, we could attribute to them uh, or to the steps before them, I should really say. Uh, so with, with leafy, whether it's doing something or not, if, it, if it's turning on, it means some, one of these is starting to move faster. So we're really uh, looking at them as detectors of all the stuff that's happening ahead of them. Pathways complicated enough that really attributing specific action to them is hard. And so the way we um, looked at it, so these are eight petal and cauliflower, and P2 is a gene with a similar role. Um, leafy is the one that starts off flowering, and terminal flower is the one that maintains the meristem and actually should be. Uh, fading out here uh, as the uh, flowers are formed. And so this, this axis is going to be how many folds of two does the expression change? So uh, this is four times, 16 times uh, expression. This is so you get an idea of the log scale there. Uh, and so this is done. Uh, with real-time PCR normalized to 18S RNA, for those of you keeping track of that sort of thing. Uh, and what we see is that in going from the floral uh, primordium to the whole uh, floral bud, these flower genes really aren't changing. So the expression that happens in the Primordium is the same as what's going on in the flower bud, so they're not uh, driving the enlargement of the uh, flower buds. Uh, leafies going down, uh, that's normally what happens with it, in terminal flowers going down a bit, that's normally what happens as the, the flowers develop. Um, so we don't, we don't have any uh, real good candidate for something that has to suddenly turn on for these floral primordia to move ahead and become the flower buds. On the other hand, looking for the release from the reproductive meristem, uh, either a petal of one or uh, something else that's turned on by the same pathway uh, that turns on the nuclear to overcome that uh, arrest at the things that are uh, breaking that arrest or turning those two genes on. Uh, so we have uh, at least candidates for breaking of that arrest stage. Uh, there's an interesting gene called fruitful, and it is spelled with two L's. Uh, and these are uh, really potentiators of the floral genes. And so you'd ex that these would be a good candidate for being the, or something else, that would turn on uh, to really make those genes uh, more effective. Uh, and while we do see a change in expression at both of the uh, transitions, they're both heading down. And uh, so that doesn't fit the model of turning on break either one. And also they're, they're relatively similar at both transitions, so it doesn't seem like they're specific to one transition or another. Um, so that one, alas, isn't providing a, a very promising story for us. And, um, and then there were some other genes that we're um, curious about. Unusual floral organs. Uh, that was, it turned out, expressed at very low levels and uh, no real change in that one. Uh, there's one that, that's uh, cauliflower curd expression, but that's really all that's known about it. It doesn't uh, have a function identified yet. Uh, what we were testing was whether it was actually holding the cauliflower curd, that it was 
was uh, preventing the release of that to make the floral primordia, uh, but absolutely no change there. And then it disappears once the flower buds are starting to grow. Uh, so it appears to have a play a role, but at a different stage uh, than we expected. So yeah, BORAM was an, another regulatory gene that we were expecting to uh, come up as the flowering developed. But really only the, in the whole group, only the AP1s are really responding. The whole suite of genes that's usually associated with that are really not moving up. Some of them are going down. Uh, so the story Leafy, which then turns on AP1 expression, we're not we're not getting the signature of that event happening, and it's difficult to go uh, too far down this road because the regulatory mechanism keeps getting more and more complicated. Uh, so we haven't even considered the potential role of the small RNAs of silence expression, which <coughs> are known to be playing a role in similar mechanisms. Uh, so for the time being, we've left that one there. Uh, so I want to move on to some breeding. So back at the ranch, more or less, literally. Uh, we've been doing work on how to do better selection. So by dividing the responses down, the, or the phenotype that you see in, in high temperature, this the the ugly heads, they're leafy, they're uneven in different ways. Dividing that up into individual physiological responses, that starts making it possible to do selection that is heritable. Before they done selection and kept the good looking ones, and those were just escapes, and so you plant them the next year and then all, a lot of them look awful, and then you keep the good ones, plant those and they look awful again. So it had been very, very difficult to get heritable selection. So by selecting for much more specific things than looks ugly, uh, it was possible to start to make headway and uh, expose them to high temperature at the time they were sensitive to get roughly the right temperature that they were exposed to. Uh, and so we moved ahead. So there is to remind you, show you uh, some not so bad looking, but not good enough to sell. Uh, so this one has a few oversized center of the worlds are lime green. So it looks polka dotted in the field. It's not going to go. Uh, so that's what we need to improve on. Uh, and so this is kind of getting to where, what's the opportunity for producing broccoli in the east. So if you look at cabbage as a sample, easy, grows anywhere, uh, whole crop, uh, you see that New York has a lot of production, about 14,000 acres, this is a big chunk in California, up and down the East Coast. Uh, Florida and Texas are, are the winter production. So clearly the East Coast is well suited for growing bowl crops. And when you look at where broccoli is grown, you find that it's virtually all in California. A little bit in the Arizona desert for winter production, and then in Aristo County, Maine, is one farm. 4,000 acres. But otherwise, it's pretty sparse on the east coast. So how are we going to get there? Well, uh, we put together a plan. Uh, so the USDA started this thing called the Specialty Crops Research Initiative a couple of years ago. And uh, the instructions were, take a big problem and find the whole solution to it. So we, we uh, we had what seemed like an awfully big problem to us, and um, basically two breeders and me. Uh, the whole solution uh, turns out to be fairly complicated because we set our goal as having a year-round supply of quality crops and the volume that the market demands. And the market demands a lot. And we got this goal basically from the planning process that this is what the retailers want. 
supermarkets were totally consistent in saying, if it's not a year-round supply, don't bother us. So, okay, that makes it a lot harder, but on the other hand, we know it's more so. So why do we want to do this now? Well, the first thing is the technology breakthrough, which is that three breeding programs have started to develop material that looks good in the summertime. Uh, and that's uh, Philip Griffiths at Geneva and Mark Farnham at the USDARS in Charleston, South Carolina, uh, and Jim Myers at Oregon State. Uh, Jim's actually been uh, breeding broccoli for the East Coast for organic production for uh, a number of years it's now with the Organic Seed Initiative. So this is one of Griff's breeding lines, grown in the same conditions as the other pictures I showed you. So that's nicely uniform. That's what we need for selling. Uh, here's another one of them. Uh, so that's that's what they're supposed to look like. So I'll show you a couple there. Good broccoli pictures. So why should we do this now? Besides that we're ready to do something, but to, to sell it to the other. So why is this the right time? So there's a number of economic factors why this should happen now. Uh, first of all, the transportation costs have gotten very high. Uh, diesel fuel, when we originally put this together, was running around $5 a gallon. And it looks like it's creeping back up there now. So the cost of transportation from California made even the California shippers start looking around, can't we grow some of this closer to, them, to our markets? Water availability in the West is starting to get more limited. And broccoli likes a lot of water. Water and fertilizer. I'm really big on that. Uh, also, the food safety rules are changing. You may have been paying attention last uh, November, December, uh, when the Senate was busy with the new food safety legislation. The kinds of things you have to do in the field to prevent uh, bacterial infection, human pathogen infection of, of fresh produce, especially something like broccoli that you eat raw, that you need to really change a lot of the practices. And cold has a lot to do with it. And not storing it quite so long so things can grow on it has a lot to do with it. So there's an opportunity there. And consumption is still going up. So even if the California growers continue to grow just as much, consumption in the East is going to go up. So uh, we'll still need to meet demand. Consumption of cabbages is not New York growers' perspective, there's a lot more promise in the crop that's going to keep going up. We also have social factors that come into play. Uh, local foods, of course, are of great interest. So what exactly constitutes local when you find broccoli in the supermarket? We don't know the answer to that, but we're pretty sure that in the same or nearby state it's better than across the country for consumers who are interested in local foods. And sustainability of food production is getting a lot of attention. Um, so there's a life cycle assessment is actually a, a field in economics where they're trying to figure out how to figure out what the carbon footprint of something is when you figure it for its entire life cycle. Uh, it's not a simple matter. It's a fairly new field. Uh, uh, and a year and a half ago, uh, Walmart started up with a sustainability index that they are really pushing down to all of their suppliers. Uh, so when I saw them, they were really excited because they've been able to cut about one quarter off the flap of the cardboard box that Kleenex comes in. And that saved thousands of tons of CO2. Uh, so if something like that matters to them, imagine what not having to truck a bunch of broccoli and ice across the country would do. Uh, they're also trying to source most of their produce on the East Coast from the I-95 corridor. So that's a big factor. And the fact that the Specialty Crops Research Initiative is there and willing to pay for this stuff is of great interest. So to overcome the barriers to getting there, we need the germplasm that works we need seed companies to produce seed of that so farmers can buy it. Uh, we need farmers.
farmers to start raising the crop knowing that they have good varieties, knowing that they have customers, and then you need the coordination so that there is supply coming from the East Coast, somewhere on the East Coast, from during the entire year. So middle of summer is really tough. There's a few places that are pulling it off now, uh, high elevation in, in the mountains, um, and uh, concentrated on the New Brunswick border. Uh, that's, that's where it really works. Um, middle of winter, down in Florida, just like everybody else. Uh, so we've got the project. There's a big breeding component, and the breeding component um, is both public and private. Uh, the idea is to develop new varieties that perform consistently well here. We have yet to find commercial varieties that, are, that will be consistent year after year uh, in producing a particular window. And to get that, we're doing regional testing. So we have five testing sites where we're going to do exhaustive trials on these things, multiple planting dates, lots of replication analysis for not only what they look like, but nutrition uh, qualities. Uh, an extension component uh, is in at least five areas. The idea is to develop groups of producers that together can supply the market for a particular period of time. So fairly uh, large volume of production. And to do that, they need to have the infrastructure so that they can have cooling and transportation. We've got a few hours to get from the field uh, to where the, uh, the broccoli is essentially at zero Celsius. Uh, you need a marketing system. The distributors will buy it, but it's, uh, it takes a lot of relationship building to make that work. Uh, so we've got a, a group in Maine. We've got a group here in New York. We've got a group in Virginia. Lower elevation, we've got high elevation in North Carolina, and then we've got South Carolina, Georgia for uh, for the November to April period. Uh, and who's involved with this? So we've got the the three academic breeders that I mentioned before, but then we brought in four different seed companies, and so part of this project is that you have to have match from industry. So these four companies have, among them actually, committed uh, quite a large sum of money that they're going to spend on their efforts to breed specifically for the East Coast. Uh, so that's an unusual thing for them to do. This is new to them also. It's very new to me to try to make that kind of arrangements. Uh, but they've committed to test and release varieties here over the five year course of spent the morning at OSP trying to figure out what the rules are going to be for trading the seeds back and forth and when you have to kill them and what you can write on packets, detail like that. Uh, so this is Mark Farnham uh, from the Charleston USDA reading program. Uh, Powell Smith is the extension agent for Clemson, so he's working with a group of growers, Mr. Clayton Brawl, one of the uh, growers in the uh, South Carolina area, uh, you can see down by their feet, this is almost pure sand, completely different from growing in New York. Uh, so they're developing the extension program for the farms in South Carolina is going to be really different from developing the extension program here. It's not just the time of year, their fertility, uh, populations, that sort of thing. Uh, are not at all going to be what ours are. We're going to have to push yields very high the same way they do with the cabbage to make it work here. Uh, being within 20% of your maximum yield uh, isn't quite good enough. You really got to push it all the way to the top. So uh, current recommendations are kind of in the ballpark, but we're not interested in kind of in the ballpark. We're interested in the very best. Uh, so that's going to take some effort to get to it. So the extension team um, that I'm the leader for the extension component, 
Uh, Christy Hopting with our vegetable program uh, is organizing the Western New York growers. Uh, Mark Hutton, uh, former reader, but is now with Extension in Maine, so he's working a little bit with a very successful farm in Maine. Uh, but he's also working to develop a group in southern Maine where you've been close to the Boston market. With Morris is an extension agent with Virginia Tech outside of Roanoke who's put together this fantastic group of growers who's supplying a supermarket chain down there. It's small growers, but they're marketing together. It's exactly the model that we're going for. Um, so that's a model that we're trying to spread so that it's not just for the really big growers. We've got the really big growers in on the front end, but having this be scale neutral is important. And he's a key player in that. Janine Davis is with North, North Carolina at what some of you know as their Fletcher Station, now called Mills River. Um, but they have two farms there, one research farm. Um, but it's where all of those mountain lion tomatoes came from, so they need to rotate something with the tomatoes. So broccoli is a great candidate. Um, and then they just bought a farm that is their organic unit, so they're going to be breeding for organic growers. Uh, but there's quite a few up in the hollows of the North Carolina mountains. And Powell Smith that I showed you earlier is with Clemson, and he's working with the larger growers in South Carolina, Georgia, and North Florida. And this is one of the big uh, growers also down in South Carolina. You can see their picking operation. Uh, so this is a conveyor belt that goes to the tractor. The uh, trim put it in the one-ton boxes, and they're just on this self-unloading trailer that they're towing behind. Uh, so they cover about 45, 50 feet as they head down there to find the crop down the conveyor belt as they go. Uh, so that's what a large-scale operation looks like. And then the distribution and marketing. Uh, we've got Miguel Gomez, who's in the Agicon department here. Uh, he studies how distribution chains work and how you optimize those uh, and where the costs are. It's funny, little things end up being big expenses. And finding ways to eliminate those is the key to making efficient distribution chains. And so there's many solutions and many non-solutions. And he's working through those. It's really very interesting to watch that process. He's got a graduate student, Shai Matala, um, who's doing a lot of the legwork on that. Uh, we've got three distribution companies involved that are, we picked them because they're really quite distinct. Cabbage Incorporated uh, is, to nobody's surprise, in the cabbage business. Uh, they have distribution on the East Coast, from East Coast cabbage growers. So they have all the infrastructure in place, the cold uh, shipping, uh, but they don't do any broccoli. They've been wanting to get into broccoli because they see the upside of it, but they haven't been doing any yet, so they're interested in adding that to their product. L&M companies is out of Raleigh, North Carolina. They distribute primarily in the southeast, but they uh, source from all over to deliver that. And they started doing a few hundred acres of broccoli in the southeast. And they say, we need to go further in the summer. We need a lot more of this stuff. And so they are very much looking to New York to provide that extra volume. Uh, Ocean Mist is uh, one of the western packer involved. Ocean Mist is a medium-sized company. They uh, have maybe 80% of the artichoke markets. So if you buy artichokes in the store, pilots are extremely good if they come from this company. Uh, they also do some broccoli. It's not their big part of their operation, but it's an important part of their operation. They've been delivering uh, to eastern markets a lot. They've lined up contracts with particular grocery store chains. That's how they like to work. One of their grocery store chains is Wegmans. So if you buy broccoli at Wegmans, it is very likely to come from this company. So they know all the efficiencies that the Western growers have. They know the quality standards that they've been meeting. So they, they have a lot to add. They have the customers already. They're very interested in reducing their transportation costs. They haven't gotten into it before because they've looked at Eastern production to see we don't recognize any we don't know where we start. Fortunately, we have people who do know how that works, and so we can make that connection. We've got re 
regional supermarkets involved. We've tried to get regional supermarkets so they don't overlap with each other, so they'll play nice for a couple of years anyway before they start trying to outdo each other. Uh, with national chains, that's almost impossible to do. But so we have Wegmans in this area, Hannaford Brothers in New England, uh, and Ingalls in the straddles the Appalachians. Uh, we're working on Publix in Florida. Uh, we're trying to distribute that way. And so that they'll be buying product that is produced as part of this project for particular uh, periods. And uh, importantly, trying to figure out what are the qualities that Eastern growers demand. So what are Eastern consumers demand. In the West, it's really, really particular. I showed you some of those kind of bad things. You may have thought, well, I would have bought that. Maybe you would have. But in the, in the West, it's precisely how long, how wide, how uniform, lumps. They're extremely particular. Um, and then they export to Asia, and then you get one step more particular. Eastern consumers seem to be less particular about things like stem length and head diameter, but maybe extremely about some other things that we haven't discovered yet. So that's what the supermarkets are going to be doing with the milk, uh, to figure out kind of what they can get away with and whether it's something that we can eat. And then we have uh, a lot of growers involved for building the networks. We're working with them to figure out the economics of it, because it is, with them also, small things that make a big difference. It's a huge investment uh, to raise the broccoli. Uh, it's all done without contract, so going into the market not knowing the, the price like you do with a contracted crop. Um, so it's a high risk, but the potential for profit is, is relatively large. Uh, but you need to do it with the, the maximum possible uh, safety margin there. And losses. Uh, so that's the story of where we're going with this broccoli project. We'll be, have that happening for the next four and a half years. And because it is intended to involve a lot of people, doing a lot of publicity about it as part of the uh, game plan, so you, the odds of you hearing something about it should be pretty good. Uh, so even if it's not in the form of So that's it. Thanks a lot.
also indicated that the, the, the low temperature was important. What about growing them in the Adirondacks? There are some valleys in the Adirondacks. Right, we'll growing, have some nice right, no, growing, growing the conventional varieties at high elevation helps. Well, but what about these new high varieties? High elevation and large fertile fields doesn't usually go together. Well, that's the, uh, the drawback of that direction, to produce the quantities that we're, we're looking for, thousands of acres. Um, but it, you asked about how much more breeding. So these are breeding lines that have been selected for looking like broccoli, but for having this one trait in particular. And for commercial varieties, you need to put together a lot of different stuff. It needs to have a whole package of disease resistance. You have to have different maturities. You have to have different sizes. Should the head be high or low? You need the dome just right. You need to put all this other stuff is this together. Multi, is, this multi, is, is the heading multi-genic? So you can't, Undoubtedly. you can't do genetic engineering and just shove in the one gene into a nice commercial variety. <laughs> no, and you were... Because you can transform them very nicely, I'm sure. They're easy to transform, but they're very difficult to sell once you've done that. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering what would happen to these new lines as you uh, subject them to colder temperatures. Would you end right. up with buttons? Right. The, too early? Well, the, uh, they are likely to want to uh, go reproductive sooner at colder temperatures. And one thing we don't know that would be part of characterizing them is, let's say the set point on the regular ones is 20 degrees Celsius. So it's kind of chilling hours between 20, below 20 Celsius. So in the ones that tolerate more heat, is that because the set point has now been moved to 25, or that the number of chilling hours under 20 has been reduced? There's two ways you can reach that. And we don't know which of those, this very descriptive ways, uh, they've been changed in order to get them to continue to develop. Uh, so if it's the number of chilling hours, then it should make very much a difference. The seeds would be produced in the normal way. They're, um, so they're hybrids. It's their secret process to get them to flower at the right time and cross with high fertility. Uh, but also, because there are seed-borne diseases, black rot in particular, uh, which we have plenty of here, uh, that really precludes producing seed in the yeast. It's that they're, they're grown where it's quite dry, uh, and also where there are specialists at producing seed. Is broccoli a high enough value crop that you could justify, say, using high tunnels for season extension? Probably not. Uh, but the transportation cost um, would be on the order of 30 cents, 20, 30 cents. So, uh, and less than that if you're coming from Virginia. So we could extend it so that we'd have the, the season equivalent to Virginia. Uh, and it's, it's unlikely that the high tunnel would make that <coughs> pay. Um, you're also looking at production on fairly large acreages. Uh, so in the southeast, the people who jumped into it have been doing sort of 100 acres at a time. And that's a lot of high tunnels. I saw seven acres of high tunnels on Long Island. That yeah. was the biggest. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so with a crop like uh, yeah, berries where your dominant cost is <coughs> harvest, that's your limitation. There it really makes a lot of sense. So uh, you said that you have a time frame of uh, four and a half years to yeah. do these. you think that's feasible um, if you are doing these uh, with breeding, because you know you have to make crosses back and forth. You have yep. to like get rid of all the undesirable book of genes that you'll introduce when you do crosses. Yeah. So I mean I don't know how long it takes to do the breeding with cabbage or uh, broccoli, yeah. but uh, it seems like a little bit short in time. And fast, yeah. We have to move fast. That's one thing. Um, yeah. So there's a, a number of 
things there. One, you can move fairly fast. The generation time in, in uh, broccoli does let you do several generations a year. And all of the starting material is, is pretty good, so there's not a lot of stuff to get rid of. Uh, it's more combining some uh, traits. Uh, and the other thing we've done by bringing the three seed companies together, each seed company wants to be the first to market. So we're, we're counting on their competitive spirits to keep them moving along quickly. Because that's where the, the breeding for cleaning it up into commercial varieties will be done. So those are the, main, the two main things. I don't understand why there's such an emphasis on North Carolina, Virginia, and South Carolina when you say the problem is heat. Further south you go, the hotter it gets. Yeah. Why aren't, I can understand oh, Maine. This, so I can understand Maine. So why aren't you yeah. going, going along the St. Lawrence Valley or something like that, where, where it's where it's going to be cooler rather than these extremely hot temperatures? Well, they they cool off later in the year when we're too cold to grow stuff. They have good growth. So these these so, these so. pictures you showed are sort of early spring or late fall. They're not. You, you don't grow, grow broccoli down there in the summer. Right, South Carolina is harvesting through November. Um, then it gets cold and you move down to Florida. Um, and they're starting transplants this week, so uh, they're harvesting. April is safe, May is less safe. It's starting to get warm. Uh, but so to get each region have maybe eight or ten weeks of harvest. You can even stick a corn crop in the middle. Uh, yeah, we're substituting collards, but we want to rotate those. But they, they do have these hot season crops down there. I haven't been to visit. <laughs> I don't have that many collards. Yes? Are, are hybrids less susceptible to this uh, buttoning uh, problem? No, I don't. That doesn't seem to be a, a real consistent difference. We look at uh, open pollinated and inbreds and hybrids. Uh, and uh, the hybrids are much more uniform, but they'll be uniformly bad also. <laughs> uh, and uh, they're much more vigorous. They're maybe twice, twice the size typically. And what, what is driving the consumption? I think it's because um, it's identified with health. That, I think, plays a big role. But also, it's very easy to use. Anti-cancer. Right. It gets a lot of anti-cancer press. Um, blood pressure lately. I'm not quite keeping track of all the good things there. Serving the, eat a lot of fruits and vegetables, and you'll be okay kind of diet. Yeah, no, president, <laughs> president that likes <laughs> right, right. Yes, and the, and the first lady has it in her garden. Shows it all. Yeah, Chris? The, the production system is a once over, or ideally as close as possible to having it very synchronized with these harvest arms where the crews go through Heart, yeah. once, maybe twice, and that's it. Is that uh, well, two or three, three is about the best. Yeah, three is, three is pretty normal at this point because the heads will only be at the right stage for a day or two depending on where you are. So it's, you're going through there with pretty quick intervals and then the field's done. So how many heads do you get on the plant? Can you cut one, one and then get another one produced on a side branch or is that You it? can in your garden, yeah, but commercially that doesn't pay off. No. Uh, but really, you want to grow it fast, harvest it, get rid of it. Avoids problems. Uh, and the, yeah, the yields are quite high. I'm talking six, eight thousand dollars an acre is quite high. How about Geneva based questions? Geneva. <laughs> they all know about broccoli. Yeah. Thomas? Oh, Gary, hi. <laughs> yeah, hi. Uh, I suppose the next real challenge would be organic broccoli, right? And so is that is that the next grant? I mean, you take four more years.
years to print on all the bugs and the fungi and, and get a nice organic broccoli that would be very, very marketable? Well, we've got uh, one seed company, uh, Bejo, has a fairly large dedicated organic division. And so it's likely that they would be uh, producing seed for organic growers. Jim Myers has been developing a population for organic production in the east. So in terms of source of broccoli, we've got that. Um, and for the production recommendations, we already have production recommendations for organic broccoli production now. So that seems like a fairly small problem. And we'll be doing uh, trials on organic research farm uh, in North Carolina and with a group of organic growers in North Carolina. So at least to that extent, the organic thread is in there right now. Uh, so well, how, how, do you how do you control the bugs and the, and the fungi? Is it re resistance or something else? No, there's, there's uh, let's see, I think there's four materials for flea beetles, for instance. That's one I happen to know from experience. Uh, so so there, there are ways. Row covers work real well, not on huge acres, but they keep things out. But the, uh, the selection of uh, really quite effective, selective uh, insecticides for organic production is pretty good. Mm. All right, I think that's it. Thanks very much. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.